Well, welcome to uh, Airmanship 2.0 case study number one, Tilting at Windmills. I'm Dave Cook. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Airmanship Excellence, and I'll be uh, your uh, co-pilot here as we go through this webinar this evening. Uh, in case you haven't attended uh, webinars on uh, GoToMeeting yet, uh, just a quick check out here on the control panel that you should be uh, seeing on your screen. There's a uh, orange rectangle with a white arrow in it that collapses your screen or expands it if uh, you have it collapsed. Uh, that's your mute button. I have all of the all of your mics and telephone. I see one of you called in on telephone. I have them all muted right now, uh, and I found that if if I don't do that, uh, we get some feedback uh, for those of you who are from those of you who are using speakers. Uh, it does inhibit the conversation a bit, but I will open up all the mics periodically uh, when we get to certain points in the webinar uh, for some discussion. And uh, at that point, you'll have a chance to uh, ask questions, make comments, and I would please invite you to do that. Uh, microphone and speakers, uh, if you have that button uh, highlighted, then uh, that's how it'll work for you. And again, if you have a headset, that would be even better because uh, with the speakers on, when your mic is open, we get feedback in the system. Or uh, you can use your telephone. I sent you in the email, uh, obviously, the info on how to hook up with the telephone. Well, you're all checked out now. I'm sure you noticed uh, this is a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but this is a webinar. Uh, so no sleeping, uh, even though it's online, because you're going to get a WINGS program credit, one knowledge credit, for attending the webinar this evening. Sponsors of the webinar are the FAA FAST team and the Center for Airmanship Excellence. I wanted to uh, start out before we get into the uh, case study this evening and just uh, get a little better idea of, of who's on the uh, uh, webinar. I've noticed a couple of names here of folks that I've talked to before, but uh, let me try uh, some here. I'm going to open up your mic, Paul. Uh, we chatted just to do a radio check there, but uh, uh, would you would you kind of give us an idea of your uh, flying and hear some questions to kind of get that started for you? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so what kind of flying do I do? Well, I've been flying a Cessna 172. I started ground school in 2008, and I got my private ASDL uh, March of 2009. I have over a little, a little over 200 total hours of the 172. And about a year ago, August 2010, I started uh, with a rotorcraft helicopter. I currently fly an R-22. I have about 86 hours in the R-22 and did a mock check ride yesterday, actually. What do you fly out of? Well, I fly out of the uh, uh, Rockford, Illinois airport for the 172, and I take uh, lessons at Lakeshore Helicopter, which is in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, about an hour and 20 minutes from my house. So sometimes I fly from Rockford to Kenosha, and then you know, most of the time it's usually about an hour and 20 minutes ride up there. Need a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I fly the airplane and I, and I fly the helicopter. I have to remind my instructor. I ask, him, "What is this now? Helicopter and airplane?" <laughs> I don't get confused. I know the problem. I used to uh, fly helicopters for the Army Guard for about ten years while I was flying for United and flying my own airplanes, and I uh, had to really tell myself sometimes what what vehicle I was in because I was doing it right. I know exactly what yeah. you mean. Well, great. Well, thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Oh, you're uh, James Schmidt, I'm going to open up your mic. I see you're on a telephone. Uh, are you with us? Yes, I am. Great. Would you mind sharing some of this information with us, please, James? Sure. I've uh, been flying since 1985. Uh, Chicago executive, uh, 500 hours, uh, single engine, land, uh, instrument rated, um, and it's purely recreational. Great. And I'm sorry, did you mention where you fly out of? Chicago Executive. Chicago Executive. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, Tom Framark, uh, you've been to some of the seminars before uh, and a couple webinars, I believe. How are you doing? Sure. Hi, Dave. Um, hi. I fly a Cessna 150 out of Galt here in northwest Illinois. Got about 300 hours in it. I try to put in about 15 hours a month. Um, 
I do a lot of scud running. I'm often seeing uh, little yellow symbols coming up on my ERA 500 GPS, and I'm just below the clouds. I did a lot of that this winter when I flew down to uh, uh, Bloomington Normal and uh, LaSalle, Peru, a couple of destinations I spend a lot of time at. And I fly over a lot of windmills, so this seminar uh, really attracted my attention. Yeah, I can see how it would. Uh, it, it, and what what do you call scud running? I mean, how, what's your floor? What are your personal minimums for AGL when you fly like that? Uh, Nineteen hundred. Okay, well that's that's plenty. Yeah. Uh, as you'll see, you know, most most of the time when we talk about scud running, we're talking about guys trying to get under you know five hundred foot overcast, low overcast, that sort of thing, which is pretty much suicide. Great. Well, thanks, Tom, uh, for coming back here to, to one of the webinars. All right, I'm going to move on. I know some more of you on here. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk to you as we go. Uh, the uh, uh, webinar is uh, designed to examine an airmanship-related accident. Most accidents, of course, as you guys know, are airmanship-related, about you know, 80 to 90%, depending on whose statistics you want to believe, or of all accidents are po caused by pilot error. So uh, that's airmanship. So we're going to look at, uh, at how this particular guy ran afoul of airmanship tonight. Uh, and I picked this one because almost all of these accidents, really, that we can uh, pull out of the database uh, uh, would work. But I picked this one because uh, it shows you that this accident could have been prevented if the pilot had been practicing what we call airmanship 2.0. And this case study involves a fatal crash, so it isn't just a little, uh, you know, fender bender. Uh, and it was uh, during a scud running flight. Uh, let me start out by giving you guys a quick overview about Airmanship 2.0. I, I see a couple of names on here that I know that have been on other webinars, so you may be familiar. So I, I'll, I'll beg your indulgence here just for a couple of minutes. I'm not going to go very deeply into Airmanship 2.0, but for you guys who haven't been exposed to it yet, let's let's just define the terms here so you know what we're talking about. Uh, and this is our definition, the Center of Airmanship Excellence. You're not going to find this in the AIM or you know in the in the NEFA manuals. We we had to uh, come up with some term that would uh, put a label on all of these things we're talking about uh, in terms of airmanship, and, and it, it's pretty extensive. So we call it Airmanship 2.0. It's our definition, and it's about it's it's defined within the context of personal flying only. So we're not talking about uh, Airmanship 2.0 as it applies to uh, military flying, airline flying, corporate flying. We're just talking about Airmanship 2.0 as it applies to our kind of flying, personal flying. And one way to look at Airmanship 2.0, what it is, uh, it, Airmanship 2.0 asks the question, if I don't fly right, should I fly at all? And of course, Airmanship 2.0 answers that question, if you're going to fly, do it right. And that's a quote uh, lifted out of uh, Tony Kern's book, Redefining Airmanship, and he quoted General Chuck Yeager. And Yeager's been saying this, uh, Kern points out, but Yeager's been saying this over and over, you know, because he does a lot of public speaking, and, and way before, uh, you know, he became an old guy. So this isn't, he's not saying this just because he got old and careful and paranoid. He's been saying this for a long time, and he ought to know, uh, you know, he, it's all about managing risk, that kind of test flying he was doing. So uh, he says, if you're going to fly, do it right. Another way to get uh, Airmanship 2.0 in, in your mind is, it's really doing it right. When we say fly in the Airmanship 2.0 way, we say that we're talking about how to fly right. Now, we we define what flying right is, and that's open to some interpretation or opinions, I'm sure. Uh, but it's so again, it's our definition. And if you don't know who we are, when I keep saying that in Airmanship in the Center for Airmanship Excellence, uh, if you go to the website. All of our board of advisors and our, our committee chairs and some of our committee members are all listed there, little bios. and You'll see we're all uh, pretty much senior aviators, a lot of experience in the game. Uh, here's a quick 35,000 foot pass on what Airmanship 2.0 is. It's really a new paradigm in personal flying, but it's based on tried and true airmanship principles that have proven to be effective with the airlines and the military. 
And then it's, uh, those tried and true principles have been modified for use by personal flyers, you know, using them in our world. In, in today's flight environment. So, you know, uh, next gen's coming. Uh, the flight environment's getting more sophisticated all the time. If we want to get out there and fly, we've got to operate in that environment. So we've got to operate in it as safely and as efficiently as we can, and that Airmanship 2.0 is designed to uh, get you to where you can do that. And also at a reasonable cost. So none of this makes any uh, sense to anybody uh, if uh, uh, you can't afford it. So uh, Airmanship 2.0 is affordable in, in our opinion. Airmanship 2.0 is also a new way for you to enjoy flying. Uh, new challenges, uh, new things to do with airplanes that are interesting, but also increase your airmanship continuously. So it's, it, you, you'll enjoy flying a lot more if you fly this way. It's a new approach to maximizing the personal rewards you get from flying. And Airmanship 2.0 increases the value you get for your flying dollar. You know, no buck, no buck Rogers. It costs money to fly, and uh, it costs a lot of money to fly. And, and you want to get, um, if you're like me, you want to get the most value out of that dollar that you're spending to go flying. So uh, Airmanship 2.0 helps you to do that. Also, Airmanship 2.0 continuously enhances your airmanship, not just uh, uh, you know once in a while. It continuously improves your skills, your airmanship skills, your airmanship knowledge, uh, your uh, airmanship capabilities. And Airmanship 2.0 is a surefire way for you to become a safer, more efficient aviator. Airmanship 2.0 includes operating within an air, what we call an airmanship development support organization. You really can't be out there totally on your own uh, and, and practice Airmanship 2.0 properly. Uh, however, guys like you, I know, Tom, you have your own airplane and your own hangar. Uh, airmanship 2.0 is designed so that you can plug into it even the way you fly. Airmanship 2.0 is belonging to a high-performing safety culture. That's part of that ADSO. And also, it includes using a safety management system, and the ADSO provides that. Airmanship 2.0 provides you with structured airmanship challenges that are fun, because we've got to have fun while we're flying. Uh, they offer recognition and rewards. That's important to all of us to keep going and, and, uh, and put in all the hard work to meet the challenges. But they're bite-sized, so it's not like jumping from the private to the instrument. They're, you know, affordable. Uh, don't take a long time. Don't take a whole bunch of effort. But you, uh, but they are moving you down that track towards better and better airmanship all the time, and and it, that means that you have continuous improvement in your airmanship, which is really what we all should be striving for. Air, uh, here's a quick formula, kind of another way to think about Airmanship 2.0. It's Airmanship Challenges, all kinds of Airmanship Challenges, uh, plus uh, Flying Fun, uh, plus Recognition. I apologize for that phone ringing. Uh, I, it's, there's no way that I can silence it quickly without, might as well just let it ring. It's... Uh, you can tell it's election season. I've been getting a call just about every night from these people. Uh, but at any rate, the formula is airmanship challenges plus flying fun plus recognition equals continuous airmanship improvement. Again, that's what we're after. Airmanship 2.0 includes your formal airmanship training, so your classroom, your simulator, your airplane flying in formal settings, plus your informal airmanship training. So every flight you take, if you're practicing airmanship 2.0, you have a plan to develop your airmanship. So that's, that's an informal training, we call it. And all that equals your personal airmanship development plan, which is a formal plan that you lay out along with a mentor pilot uh, and some tools that uh, uh, helps you to reach the qualifications you want, the level of qualifications you want, uh, to do what, what you want to do with an airplane. Uh, Airmanship 2.0 includes a personal training team, not just an instructor or a flight school. It's a personal training team made up of training management, mentor pilots, senior instructors, and associate instructors. So it's a little different approach uh, to, tr to your training than you're used to in general aviation. 
Also, uh, Airmanship 2.0 includes airmanship development tools because uh, self-assessment, assessing after every flight is a crucial part of, of all, uh, continuous improvement. So uh, you need some tools to, to make that easier for you and more effective for you. And there are several tools. I'll show you one here. Uh, this is called the uh, Pario Vision 1000 system. This uh, flight data recorder um, is usually mounted up here on the overhead in an airplane. It's about the size of the palm of your hand. You can see it's got a window there for the video recorder. It has audio recorder. Uh, it also has uh, uh, it's a flight data recorder, you know, attitude, accelerations, airspeed, altitude, all of those things, heading, so that it all gets recorded in a, in a SD card. And then uh, you can download that, or upload it, I should say, the card to the uh, uh, Internet. There's a host uh, run by the Apario folks. And then you can, uh, from any PC with an Internet connection, review your flight. So, uh, you know, app, iPod, whatever you have. And you can look at your flight, you can look at the video, listen to the audio, but you can also look at it in many different ways. Here's a representation of a graphic representation with the instruments. You can see traces, so you can look like at altitude holding and that sort of thing. So it's an excellent analytical tool. Then uh, you have other uh, video recorders in the cockpit also that are catching some other angles that are very helpful for self-assessment. So that's a tool. There are others that you need to practice Airmanship 2.0. Airmanship 2.0 includes the kind of airplanes you fly. Uh, and uh, we, th we believe that if you're practicing what we define as Airmanship 2.0, you should be flying the safest, most modern, uh, best equipped airplanes possible. Uh, so uh, we talk about like the Cirruses, that would be a modern Airmanship 2.0 airplane. In fact, Cirrus, you know, they have a, uh, one of their angles on their advertising is flying 2.0, so they're already thinking this way. Uh, LSAs with the safety features, like this happens to be the flight design CTLS, but also using tail draggers because the biggest accident category, if you want to combine a couple categories into one, takeoff and landing accidents, that's the biggest number of accidents that we have. And you know, we have about three and a half accidents a day out here in general aviation with more than one a day being fatal. So uh, the uh, we believe that learning to fly in a tail dragger and maintaining proficiency in a tail dragger will go a long way to curing those takeoff and landing accidents. So, but that uh, this particular that's American Legend Cub. It's got a parachute. So even though it's an old design, it's a modern airplane, if you will. Also, Airmanship 2.0 includes the way that you fly them because you're going to be flying for personal transportation, the challenge of, of it, of learning, getting better, and for the fun of it. So really the way we start with that Airmanship development plan, we start with the question, what do you want to do with an airplane? And then we, uh, we can tell you, uh, the Center for Airmanship Excellence can tell you, your mentor pilot can tell you uh, how to go about, what qualifications you need to do that safely and effectively with an airplane and affordably. And then he, uh, he or she can help you to lay out that personal airmanship development plan to, re to get those qualifications. Also, one of the biggest, uh, most important part of a of Airmanship 2.0, I mentioned you have to operate within uh, that ADSO, that Airmanship Development Support Organization, which is a generic term. But that ADSO provides trip planning for you. The 22 years I flew for United, they took care of all that stuff, the trip planning, the flight planning. Uh, you know, and that's something that uh, you should be offloaded from as much as possible to keep your mind free for all of the other things you got to be thinking about before a flight. And a, a team, a dispatch team, has more resources, can take more time, can be more methodical, uh, has, it can have more than one person uh, looking at that flight plan uh, so that then when you uh, get ready to look over the flight yourself, you've got it all prepared for you. And then, of course, you've got to make your own decisions about the flight plan based on what's been put together and then either modify it or fly it. And, uh, and the uh, operations center or flight operations support team uh, then agrees with you, the PIC, that the flight is safe to go and they dispatch you, just like the airlines do it. If you think about it, this we call the shared decision making. It's a principle of Airmanship 2.0. Uh, and shared decision making is, uh, makes flying much safer and would probably eliminate, I, I, my guess is, 
probably 80% of those pilot error accidents because if you go, if you trace the error chain back in most, in those accidents, at least all of them I've looked at and I've looked at hundreds of them, the, uh, it starts with that go, no go decision. You know, the get there itis, the external pressures, all of that stuff, the inadequate preparation, the inexperience, maybe, you know, you're, you've just started flying and, you know, the, all of that stuff gets cranked into those bad go, no go decisions. And a dispatch operation will pretty much solve all that. Uh, flight tracking, so you're never out there alone, uh, tracking you with satellite tracking system, in-flight support, uh, sat phones and airplanes so that you, they can, uh, dispatch can provide you with information that comes their way that you may not have. You can call them and get information, have them rearrange things if you got to go to an alternate, all kinds of support. And of course, manage all of this stuff, all the changes that you know, come up in most trips. So that's in-flight support as part of Airmanship 2.0, dispatch operation. Well, we took about 15 minutes or so to go through that. Again, I, I think it's important to orient you for the, the, the core of the discussion here this evening, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it, there's a lot more information here that you, uh, that's available to you about Airmanship 2.0, how it works, what it is, why it's good for you, how to get it, all those kinds of things. And you'll find uh, that information at the uh, Center for Airmanship Excellence website, airmanshipexcellence.org. And if you click on that uh, menu button up there on the upper left, so it's Airmanship 2.0, it takes you in there and uh, has all the information you could possibly want about Airmanship 2.0. So that's a quick overview, but I'm going to open up the mics here uh, while uh, uh, just to make sure that, uh, see if anybody has any questions about Airmanship 2.0 or uh, any, wants to make any comments. Now, all of your mics are open right now. Tom, I know that your concern was way back when you looked at this about a year ago that you were operating out of there, uh, out there by yourself, flying your own airplane. Uh, but we, you know, you were one of the guys that caused us to uh, caused us to uh, come up with a, a a process whereby you could a guy like you could plug into this the safety culture, the safety management system, the uh, uh, the flight ops support system to the extent that you want to equip your airplane, all of that sort of thing, mentor pilots, all of that. Uh, what, what do you think about that? you think that would be a solution for you, Tom? And I'm going to open up your mic. Yeah, Tom here. Uh, yeah, I'm still fascinated by it, and I've taken up uh, some of those uh, ideas myself. I put my own little flight recorder on my iPhone 4 to uh, watch my landings, and I critique them myself. Uh, but I certainly like the idea of uh, the mentor pilots, somebody who I can uh, talk to and who I feel like is looking over my shoulder occasionally. It's a very good way to uh, keep you on your toes, so to speak. You're, you're right, and I'm going to mute your mic again. Uh, you're absolutely right, Tom, and, and uh, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're doing some things to, to help you self-assess. And uh, but as uh, Kern pointed out, uh, and as we went through the redefining airmanship series, uh, you know, it came out in a couple of those webinars that the data shows that that we all human beings are lousy at self-assessment. We have to do it to the best of our ability, and we have to use all the tools like you know video recording that we can that we can uh, employ. Uh, to help ourselves do it, but we still need to have somebody else looking at us. That mentor pilot, if you will, flies with us occasionally, knows the right questions to ask us, you know, for the point we are and our experience level and all that. So uh, that's great. I'm glad to hear you're working on that. Uh, John Munson, I'm going to open up your mic and, and wonder, uh, I know you attended at least one of the airmanship uh, uh, webinars that we did earlier, and I'm just wondering what you're thinking about airmanship 2.0 right now. Are you there, John? Okay, either John can't get through or he's sleeping. All right, I'm gonna I'm going to uh, mute your mic, J uh, James Schmidt. You have a uh, you want to share any opinion or any comments on this? Uh, Dave, this is my first uh, presentation that I'm sitting on, so I think I'm just taking this whole thing. Yeah, I don't I don't really have that much I can contribute at this time, so I'm just I'm just kind of kind of new to this whole thing. Okay, I understand that. What's your first impression? I'm interested in that, of what you've just seen. 
um, I think it's kind of bringing flying into the 21st century. Um, I, I, I think I'm a little concerned that what I fly today in the terms of like a, a Piper Archer or whatever may not be the state-of-the-art airplane that one is once. Maybe I have to think about getting into one of the more modern airplanes. I don't know. Well, good. Well, that's what. Thanks, James. That, that's what this is all about. Is get you know, is to provide food for thought, and uh, it's all logical. It all fits together. Uh, but again, there's so much there until you you need to you need to spend the time to get the information before you can make any decisions. And, and I know, like John Munson's been uh, uh, looking at this, and, and Tom's been looking at it for a while. And that's what you guys need to do. So, thank thanks for that feedback, James. I appreciate it. Okay, let's get into the case study then. I, I, I imagine you guys are on here uh, tonight because you like these case studies. You know, I, I, I love case studies, uh, accident case studies. I always learn a lot from them. And, so, uh, uh, and, and I, I went through this one in, I believe it was the Kern Airmanship Model series of webinars and, and seminars. Uh, but I've updated it and, and added a little information. But I like this. This is a very interesting uh, scenario. Uh, and by the way, I didn't. I guess I should have mentioned it. There, there's uh, airmanship archives on the uh, airmanship Center for Airmanship Excellence website, airmanshipexcellence.org. And in the archives, you can view all of these uh, wings program webinars that we did. There's I don't know, uh, 15 or more, maybe more now. I, I've lost track. Uh, that are available uh, video, as videos. You can just view them on the website uh, anytime you want. So uh, that's that's a good way to see what this is all about, too. Uh, tilting at windmills. Uh, the accident took place uh, about three years ago in February, so that's an important factor here to keep in mind. It was middle of the winter. It was a Cessna 140, uh, a 1948. Uh, that's, that's, that airplane's a year newer than me. Uh, it's a 60-year-old airplane when the crash happened, 60-year-old airplane. Look, this isn't the particular airplane. I couldn't get a picture of the airplane. This is just a good-looking 140. Uh, I used to fly one. I used to own a 140 or a piece of one with a couple of other guys. Nice little airplanes, but it's an antique. So this is only three years ago, so he was flying an old airplane. Uh, the pilot was the sole occupant of the aircraft, so thank God he didn't kill anybody else. That uh, was a fatal. The pilot was 54 years old, held an airline transport pilot certificate. In addition to that, he had seaplane and commercial helicopter ratings. He had type ratings in four transport category aircraft. He had 21,000 hours total time. And he's a, he was a current airline captain. So this guy was not like, he's not a personal flyer. This guy's a professional flyer. And he was fl currently flying for the airline. So he was, uh, I would have to assume, current and proficient, at least in, in airline flying. He had no accident, incident, enforcement, or disciplinary action. So over a, that career he had, uh, that's a pretty good job. So he probably had fly, uh, a lot of flight discipline, uh, which is a crucial part of, of Airmanship 2.0. Uh, you know, he, this guy was uh, not a, a weekend aviator. He was, he was professionally trained. Uh, he planned to fly uh, from the takeoff point, which was up by the Twin Cities, down to Fulton, Missouri for a family event. So keep that in mind. He had, he had some place to be. Uh, the aircraft, he had just bought it that morning. So uh, he probably didn't know a whole lot about the airplane. The pilot was aware that it needed an annual inspection. The owner testified that the guy he bought it from that he told him. Now, you know, maybe he didn't, but a, guy, a professional pilot especially, you know, knows the rules for airworthiness, and he needed to be looking at the log books, uh, you know, especially if you just bought the airplane. So, you know, he had to be aware that the airplane was out of license. So he he was uh, willfully uh, non-compliant with a, a, one of the big rigs right there, right up front. He did not obtain a ferry ferry permit. So, I, you know, you could say, well, okay, he knew it needed a, uh, it was out annual. Uh, so the right thing to do would be to get a ferry permit, and then he could move the airplane. But it looks like he wasn't moving it for maintenance. He was moving it for personal transportation. Uh, and, and the accident report doesn't say where he lit, where he was from, but I'm assuming it, he was probably a Northwest pilot up, living up there in the Twin Cities area because that's where the flight originated. 
Uh, the only attitude instrument in the Cessna's panel was a Venturi-powered turn and bike. Uh, bank. Now, some of you new guys may not even know what that Venturi powered TNB is. Here's a picture of a Venturi. We used to have these sticking out airplanes. There were a lot of these around when I started flying. Still, you know, typical Venturi principle. Uh, it reduced the pressure here at the bottleneck, and then they tapped uh, that suction off, and it drove the gyro uh, in this uh, oops turn and bank indicator, which was uh, before the turn coordinator. It worked like the turn coordinator. It's a gyro in there and all that. It was, uh, and I don't know, some people think it was harder to use. I, I kind of liked them, but it did the same thing. If you were, had, if you were, if the, uh, if you were turning left, the needle came over to left and right. You could do half standard rate turns, and these are standard rate here. Of course, they had the ball and all that. And if, if you practiced on the uh, on needle uh, ball, you could get real good at it. You could fly needle ball, airspeed, whiskey, compass, and altimeter all day long in, in, in the clouds uh, because I used to do it a lot when I was, a, I was an instrument instructor in the Army helicopters. and So that was part of our training program was that that was our partial panel. And you could get real good at it, but you had to train up. And you had to stay proficient at it. And that's something, not a skill that lasts very long. So, but that's all he had in the airplane. Whoops. And the aircraft that had uh, no artificial horizon, no DG. The only nav equipment on the airplane was a handheld GPS. The weather, uh, the surface op observations confirmed widespread IFR conditions forecast along the route. The pilot was presumably aware of this, uh, as well as advisory uh, for moderate icing below 8,000 feet because beginning the evening before, he obtained three uh, duet briefings. So he, he obviously knew what the weather was. Uh, and all, all of those briefings predicted instrument meteorological conditions for his route. So here's a non-IFR equipped airplane. He's going to go out and fly it on an, uh, in an IFR situation. So obviously, he was planning on scud running right from the beginning. No flight plan was filed, so you know he didn't. He was didn't want to, anybody to know what he was doing, obviously, uh, and he uh, never made contact with air traffic control. So this is a pattern you can see of non-compliance with the regs, uh, and he was covering up here by not letting anybody know what he was doing out there. Uh, he departed New Richmond, which is uh, again up there just northeast of the Twin Cities, at uh, noon, right around noon on that cold February day. He planned a fuel stop in Oskaloosa, Iowa, uh, and that was 236 miles from New Richmond. Now, that, old, that 140, as I recall, cruises around 90 knots. So he was looking at a two-and-a-half or so hour flight just uh, for that first leg down to refuel uh, and, and under those low clouds the whole way. Now, that land is pretty flat. Uh, between there, and there's some rolling, but it's pretty flat, so I give them that, but, and it is fairly spar sparsely populated. Uh, then after the fuel stop, he was planning on flying to his final destination, Fulton, Missouri, uh, and that was 145 nautical miles more down there, and a total distance of about 380 nautical miles. Uh, so if you think about it, and you add in the fuel stop, I, I estimate it was about uh, five hours total portal-to-portal uh, -portal flight time and uh, if he left at noon in February, he had, he was going to be landing in you know right after dark. So he's scud running in an airplane with no instruments, and he's going to be doing the last part of it at dark after dark or right, right at the in civil twilight. Anyhow, uh, the weather uh, when he took off from New Richmond was barely qualified as a marginal. VFR. It was 1,500 overcast, so the ceiling wasn't too bad, but the visibility was only a mile and a quarter in light snow. Uh, condition, uh, the conditions were significantly lower farther south, and as we saw, he got a briefing on that. He knew about it. The airport closest to where he finally augured in uh, was reported uh, overcast skies at 400 feet uh, with a, uh, a visibility of a mile and a half and only a one degree spread on the temp and dew point. So it was it was low ceilings. The aircraft crashed near Grand Meadows, Minnesota, so pretty much right on that straight line to where he was going down for the fuel stop, 
but it's only 120 miles out, so he's, you know, an hour and 15, 20 minutes into the flight, so as far as he made it. He was planning that five-hour flight. Uh, the airplane impacted the uh, level ground in no, nose low while banking to the left, and that is a picture of the crash airplane right there. Uh, the 300-foot debris field suggested that it hit at flying speed. The main wreckage was found just 100 yards from a field of 400-foot tall wind uh, turbines. That day their blades would have reached the bottom of the clouds. So you can, I think, start to we get a real good picture of what, what happened here. They found no evidence uh, that the Cessna had hit any of the windmills. And data retrieved from that GPS, and by the way, this is kind of an eye-opener, a handheld GPS that could get this kind of data out of it. Uh, data recovered from the GPS suggested that it tracked the direct line uh, from New Richmond uh, to Oskaloosa at altitudes from 300 to 600 feet. So he was staying under it the whole time, obviously, uh, until a little more than two minutes before the crash. When it uh, abruptly turned 90 degrees to the left and flew east for about a minute. It then made a figure eight turn at altitudes between 900 and 1500 feet AGL. And of course that was well above the bases. So he, he was in the clouds. So, you know, what do you think? He probably was tooling along down there, scud running at, you know, 90 knots, and all of a sudden, boom, there's those uh, uh, windmills, and it's, he was so close in, you know, a mile and a quarter out, uh, that he probably just reacted, and the reaction was probably, you know, pull back and left bank. That's what it, that'd be my guess. Got it up there, and, and immediate, he was immediately in the clouds, so he had to make that ragged, immediate transition to that turn and bank indicator that he had probably last used maybe 50 years ago. You know, I mean, you don't use those in airliners, not even in airliners. So uh, the he was not proficient on that one instrument that he had in there. So it, it looks like, uh, and then he kind of wandered around here a little bit. Uh, the uh, report doesn't specify whether or not the windmills were in the GPS, but Three years ago, I'd be surprised if the wind farms were in there, uh, but possibly. The, uh, but the way it looked, you know, flying that straight line, uh, either he didn't check it on the GPS if it was in there before he left, or he wasn't paying attention as he was getting close. And, and uh, he probably couldn't be paying much attention to that GPS because his eyes had to be out the window locked on the ground just to, to do what he was doing. And, and I, I have done this, I will admit. I've been down lower than this, and in fact, I was just thinking about it as I was talking in that last slide, in my old 140 back when I was a 17-year-old, maybe even 16 as I was working on my private, I was out there in a day just like this, scud running, and you know, I lived through it. Uh, but I sure, sure as heck wouldn't do this again now. Uh, that was very bad decision making. And, you know, and a lot of us have done it, and that's part of the problem. You do it and get away with it, and now that encourages you to try it again the next time. And it's really only a matter of time on this scud running. But, uh, so he, he probably didn't know those uh, uh, windmills were there. And it was probably a total surprise, a bad surprise, when he saw them sticking up. Now, they did the toxicology test, of course, and uh, no carbon monoxide or cyanide was detected, so that, that wasn't a problem. No ethanol, so he, he didn't have a whole uh, bunch of uh, alcohol in his, in his body. But he did have some drugs. Uh, you can probably pronounce this one, Tom, but I'm not even going to try it. Uh, but it was in the urine, but not in the blood. Uh, but it's an over-the-counter over -counter antihistamine, and it has sedative effects. So he was self-medicating probably had a cold or something, looks like. He was also using ibuprofen, so he was mixing drugs, which is a huge no-no. I don't know if you guys know it or not. I didn't until about a year ago when I was doing some research, but, uh, you know, the FAA has a list of pro uh, prescribed or pro uh, uh, prohibited uh, drugs that you can take when you fly, and, and aspirin is one of them if it's used in combination with some other drugs. And I forget the names of the other drugs, but so you even have to be careful if you're taking aspirin and other drugs. So he had some drugs. So he probably uh, was somewhat impaired to some extent by the effects of the drugs, because one of them was a sedative or had sedative effects, 
and uh, also by what the illness that caused him to take those drugs. Uh, there is no knowing how often pilots sneak below the scud. You know, we do it a lot. And, and Tom, I know you call that scud running, but if you're maintaining a hard hard deck of a couple thousand feet or 1,900 feet or so above the ground or even 1,500 feet above the ground, you know, and it's never you never let it get down below a couple th miles visibility, that's not very dangerous if you know your route and if you know where the obstacles are, you have a good GPS. But uh, getting down there in it, you know, below 500 feet, well, you know, even below 1,000 starts to get dangerous, but you get down there below 500 feet, even in relatively flat country, and it's dangerous. And I, and I hit, back when I was flying those Army helicopters, we did this a lot, and you could slow a helicopter down, and you can land if you have to and all that, and, and I've done a lot, a lot of scud running in helicopters, uh, so I, I have a lot of experience in that environment, and it, it's it's a tough one when you get down that low. And, and that's what gets people. You get sucked in. You keep going. There's a little bit of light up ahead. And you can go, I, I can make it. I can make it through. But then, then they don't. Uh, and a lifetime of flying may have left this pilot uh, so much at ease in the air that he thought he could take this little airplane, little simple airplane, and heck, it was he had a good GPS, and he'd just fly low and get down there. Complacency. Uh, uh, and you know, he was breaking the 500-foot uh, minimum altitude anyhow over uncongested terrain. He was probably uh, closer than uh, than he should have been to buildings and everything else. So he was non-compliant. Uh, but low ceilings and and uh, and marginal visibility leave little margin for error or time to react to the unexpected. When you're down that low with a mile, mile and a half visibility. You you're just when you see something like those windmills, you just react. You can't think of what your move has to be. Thousands of hours in a logbook won't soften the impact if the aircraft runs out of airspace. You can die just like a low-time pilot. It's tempting to think of VFR and the IMC as the province of low-time pilots because it's a judgment error. A rookie mistake made by aviators too inexperienced to realize how quick they can lose control without visual references or how fast obstructions can, can rush up out of one mile visibility. But the evidence, surprisingly, says otherwise. Uh, over the past 10 years, one-third of all VMC and IMC accidents involved commercial or airline transport pilots. So it's really not that much related to skill levels, related strictly to judgment. And uh, neither higher certificate levels nor hours in the logbook mitigate the consequences. You're just as dead if you've got 21,000 hours in your book or 21 hours. And the worst part is 80% of all these accidents are fatal, so they aren't very survivable because you usually hit the ground going at cruise speed or close to it. So that's the accident. Uh, I threw a little commentary in there, but not uh, not all a lot because uh, I wanted to save it for a little discussion here. But I, I build this as not only going through this case study and talking about some of these things, but I, I wanted to, to use it to show how if, if this guy had been practicing airmanship 2.0 in his personal flying, he was practicing airmanship 2.0 in his airline flying because that fits the def, our definition of airmanship 2.0 is how they do it at the airlines. But he got out of that environment, and he didn't take his airmanship 2.0 with him, and there were some pieces missing, uh, uh, some airmanship 2.0 elements missing in the personal flying war, uh, environment he was operating in, like dispatch. Obviously, if he had had his flight dispatch that supported him at the airline, uh, you know, they would have said, uh, don't go. Uh, and, and he even just knowing he had to talk to somebody else, the peer pressure, if you will, within the organization, with the envir within the environment, probably would have kept him from making that, that uh, stupid mistake. So that's what we talk about shared decision making, and it's especially important in that go-no-go -no -go, uh, situation. So if he'd been practicing Airmanship 2.0, that accident never would have happened. Uh, obviously, uh, we define Airmanship 2.0 as flying aircraft, that are modern, have all the safety features, uh, and that they're equi properly equipped for however you're flying the airplane. Well, in this case, if you were going to go out there in a day like that, I wouldn't want to go out there without an airplane that was fully IFR capable, and, and I was capable. And, uh, uh, you know, I had a, my backup plan if I was going to do any kind of scud running would be, to, you know, one of the outs would be to get up there in it and, and fess up and get a clearance and, and, and go land someplace. So, uh, 
you know, that if he had been flying under Airmanship 2.0, he wouldn't have been out there on a day like that in an old airplane. Airmanship, nothing in Airmanship 2.0 says you can't fly old airplanes. That's part of Airmanship challenges. But uh, you have to uh, fly them only within the um, environment that they're safe in. Uh, and, of course, there would have been a lot better flight planning for this flight. Now, did he really even think through his total flight time door to door and, and think about getting down there in low vis under the in scud running uh, close to dark? Uh, I, I don't know, but dispatch sure as heck would have been, you know, his team uh, would have been watching that. So I think that would have been avoided. Also, in Airmanship 2.0, we have some impairment recognition tools that we use. Uh, and impairment can be caused by many things. Fatigue, is, of course, is the big one, but stress causes impairment. All kinds of things can cause impairment. Those over-the-counter drugs he was taking caused impairment to some extent. Well, you can tell it's within a, you know, a fuzzy range. It isn't a precise science yet. Very easily what your relative level of impairment is. And, uh, and it's a good thing to know before you fly. You can either decide, I don't want to fly because I'm too impaired, or you can say, well, I know I'm impaired, so I'm going to open up, you know, what, how I do things. Maybe I, I have, I open up my personal minimums with visibility and ceiling or something. I mean, there's a lot of ways to mitigate uh, the risk caused by that impairment if you know it's there. But as we all know, impairment is insidious. So a lot, we're, we're lousy at recognizing impairment in ourselves. So uh, if he was flying under Airmanship 2.0, he would have had some tools that he could have used for that. Also, he would have had that flight tracking and in-flight support if he'd been flying in a an Airmanship 2.0 environment. And I think that would have kept him from going because uh, someone else would have known what he was doing, too. Also, uh, he flew within a safety culture at the airlines. And, and a big part of safety cultures are the peer pressure uh, built in the peer pressures built into safety cultures, intentionally or just inherently built in, and and, and it's positive and negative uh, peer pressure. Got to have both. And and if you know he if he was out there hanging around the dispatch center at, at the airline airport telling the other guys he was thinking about going out and do this, you know they would have told him he was nuts. So that he would have had a lot of negative peer pressure. Uh, and, but he didn't have that because in, in his personal flying world, there was no safety culture that he operated in there, so he, it didn't help him. So those are just some quick examples of if he had been flying within Airmanship 2.0, that accident wouldn't have happened. That's how it would have saved him. So I'm going to open up the mics again here for uh, uh, comments and questions. And again, I have to open them all up to start out, so if somebody wants to talk, just jump in and then I'll mute the other mics. Somebody want to venture a uh, comment on, uh, do they agree with me that uh, if they were practicing these aspects of Airmanship 2.0 as I presented them, that that accident would not have happened? Well, Dave, it's Tom. I'd like to make a comment. Please. Please. Well, I mean, this is just a total cascade of errors. In some ways, it sounds very familiar to me. Uh, it's where a seemingly intelligent person makes a whole series of wrong decisions. A brand new airplane, you should fly it around in VFR conditions. Uh, VFR flight into instrument conditions, what a disaster. Um, overconfident. Uh, somehow I seems like I've heard this kind of story before, although you explained this one in, in great detail. Um, how high or large houred pilots with many hours, tens of thousands of hours, can make stupid mistakes. Uh, it's a recurrent theme. I don't think you even need a mentor pilot to tell you this. It's just something that uh, each individual should think about and realize before they make a, a dumb or stupid flight like this. I see no logic in this whatsoever. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to mute your mic to kill the feedback. You're absolutely right. You put your finger on it. And, and it's really interesting, I think, the fact that this guy was so experienced and well-trained and everything, and still, as you say, went ahead and set up that error chain, as we call it, that led to the accident. You know, as I'm sure you've all heard, uh, when you get into formal airmanship training, uh, sometimes it's, it, well, it's always included in cockpit resource management training and so forth. We always talk about the error chain that leads to accidents. Accidents are very seldom caused 
by one thing. There's a, these links in the chain that build up, and if you can identify and, and remove any one of those links, you're not going to have an accident. So he obviously had all kinds of links that he just laid down for himself that led to that accident. But the interesting thing is a guy like this could do it. And, and I think that the, the point to remember is that he, he, operate, he operated within Airmanship 2.0 environment at the airlines, and he was used to that, and he obviously was very successful over the years, and he never would have made a decision like this at the airlines. He wouldn't have been able to, but he could do it over here because he wasn't operating in an Airmanship 2.0 environment in, on this day in this environment. So uh, the, if he was, as I pointed out, this w it would have removed you know, all these links in that error chain. And, and again, I come back, it would have removed that first link. He wouldn't have gone and never would have happened. So, uh, yeah, that's how it all fits together. It's a very good observation, Tom. Yeah, I'm going to open up the mics just one more time here to see if anybody else has a question or comment before we close things up. Question or comment before we close things up. Hey, Dave, this is Paul. Yes, Paul, please. Yes, Paul, please. Well, I, I think, too, you, you hit uh, a good point at the beginning about it was a family event and he had that get there either. So I think that's a uh, common mistake that a lot of uh, pilots make is they either have to get somewhere or get home or get to a meeting and that tends to cloud their thinking as far as um, planning the flight, fuel stops and those types of things. It seems to be that, that get there either seems to be more of a focus than the actual flight itself. Yes, thank, thank you, Paul. It's a good observation, great observation. And, and, and we call those elements that, that cause get their itis external pressures, right? When we're talking about aeronautical decision making, that's the term the FAA uses. I think it's a good term. External pressures, put them all in that, in that one basket over there. Uh, and it can be a many, many things. And, and when you learn Airmanship 2.0, you learn to recognize those kinds of things as caution warning lights. So that's how you avoid them, uh, and it's uh, you know that broke down on this guy this day. But in our personal flying world, we see all these accidents out here in our world every day, or every day, or three and a half a day, and so many a year, twelve, fourteen hundred a year. Uh, it, our, you're right; it's the same things over and over, and guys making these kinds of bad decisions. But the good news is, if you fly within the right kind of environment and you learn how to do it and then practice that way, you can avoid all this stuff and be, you know, safer than the airlines. You know, the, the general aviation accident rate right now is about seven and a half accidents per 100,000 hours of flying time, and the airlines are about 0.15 accidents per 100,000 hours. Uh, if you think about it, if we flew in our personal flying world with all of these things that we're talking about here, that, that that's Airmanship 2.0, which is what the airlines use, we should actually have a better accident rate than the airlines because we don't have to go like these guys, quote unquote, have to go. You know, they, if it meets minimum government regulations, they got to go or they get fired. So uh, they are, uh, they do have external pressures they can't avoid if they want to be professional pilots, but we can avoid those, especially if we have people helping us avoid them. So, uh, yeah, it's it's all of that. So, well, great, guys. Thanks for uh, the participation and the feedback and the good questions. Uh, also, I want to just take one minute uh, to talk about uh, the elements of what we call the Kern Airmanship Model. Dr. Tony Kern, he's the guy that wrote the books, uh, uh, redefining airmanship and and uh, flight discipline that we kind of use as our Bibles and creating airmanship 2.0. Uh, and he uh, Kern developed this airmanship model, and I, we think it's great. And you can see here that uh, it has three bedrock principles: discipline, skill, and proficiency. Five pillars of knowledge: self, aircraft, team, environment, and risk. Two capstone outcomes: situational awareness and judgment. And judgment, of course, is what we're after in airmanship. So, because uh, uh, that's what keeps us alive or kills us if it's bad. So, uh, if we if we we could look at this accident and look at every one of these elements in the current airmanship model, and we see where that guy had a major uh, disconnects in all of these elements. For example, aircraft. As Tom pointed out, you know, he didn't familiarize himself with the aircraft. He just bought it that morning. So uh, uh, he didn't he, he didn't have much knowledge of aircraft. 
knowledge of self. Well, you know, and, and I can point out one thing there, and just with the impairment, with the, the he probably didn't know how impaired he was. Uh, that's just one example of knowledge of self. Team. He didn't have a team, and he, and he should have known that he was. He didn't have that insurance policy that that team provides. He should have been even more careful. Of course, he didn't have much knowledge of his environment. The glaring example there is he probably didn't know those windmills were there, and of course, risk. Uh, you know, he just he just ignored the risk. He probably had knowledge of risk, but he sure didn't have knowledge or didn't apply knowledge of how to mitigate the risk. Uh, he didn't have proficiency in instrument flying with the turn and bank indicator. His discipline broke down. Uh, you know, one has to wonder about his skill level in that tail dragger if he'd flown one in a lot of years or not. And so all he had all those disconnects or breakdowns in these elements. So therefore, his situational awareness was very poor, which resulted in a, a series of bad judgments that led to his death. Well. I want to close up here and just say, uh, give you some next steps you might want to think about if this piqued your interest about looking a little bit more into Airmanship 2.0. Uh, I first thing I do is suggest that you register for Airmanship updates on the AirmanshipExcellence.org website. They're free. Uh, I, we send them out periodically when there's something new going on or uh, some information we think you might want to have if you're interested in Airmanship development. Uh, you, you can look for all of these briefings, as I mentioned, at the website, airmanshipexcellence.org. You can view them there. Any briefings that uh, you've missed so far might want to pick up. And we're going to continue these series of briefings as FA Wings programs now. Uh, we, you can view the Airmanship 2.0 briefings, uh, uh, which are separate from the Wings program briefings, uh, in that Airmanship 2.0 section of the uh, center's website. If, if you want to participate in that ADSOD, we are in the process of standing up that Airmanship Development Support Organization, and you can find out all about what that is, how it works, and so forth at the website. Just go uh, click on, when you get in the Airmanship 2.0 area, click on the ADSOD briefing, uh, and you'll find out about that. And there's three ways you could participate, so if you're interested, you can hook up with us that way. We now have about a uh, little more than two dozen uh, Center for Airmanship Excellence volunteers that are working on this and participate. We're doing different things to uh, get all this Airmanship 2.0 put together, build the training tools that, you, that people can use to learn how to use it, and then again, as I mentioned, to stand up that EDSOD so that we have the new airplanes and the Ops Center and the simulators for the, doing the right kind of training and all those kinds of things. So it, you can find out all about that in the briefings. So I suggest you might want to take a look at those things if, if you're interested in all this. I want to thank you for your time. Really appreciate it for your feedback and participation. If you have any other questions, I think you can tell I'm passionate about all this, but I, we're at the stage where your feedback is important, positive, negative, brainstorm ideas, whatever it might be about this, uh, because you know, we're in the building process now, and all that input is, is real valuable. So give me a call. Here's my phone number if you're interested in talking about it. I'm always open to talking about it. Send me an email at theairmanshipexcellence.org, uh, or you can. there's a contact button at the website that you can get to me. Well, I'm going to leave you with this thought. Fly safely.